Good morning and welcome to each one of you. Welcome to the weekend worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City on this Celebration Sunday. Can you imagine? It was one year ago on Celebration Sunday that we had to close our building with apologies to our guest speaker. It was the first time we joined together on Zoom for a hastily arranged coffee hour. Many of us had never even heard of Zoom, much less used it before. But we knew that what we needed more than anything in that moment was to be together somehow. We needed some place that we could go with our fears, our worries, our uncertainty. We knew that somehow being in community would give us a chance to catch our breath and feel a little less alone. And my goodness, we've kept it going all year. We're still finding refuge and community, still reminding each other that we are here together some kind of way. I invite you to take one moment now as we begin our worship and just breathe in gratitude for all that this community has meant to you this year. It is all worthy of celebration and praise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to First Unitarian Church on Celebration Sunday 2021. Our Celebration Sunday tradition, which now goes back at least 20 years, has always integrated our past accomplishments with, with a forward-looking eye to all the work that remains for a justice-seeking congregation. Historically, at the official start of our pledge campaign, which is what Celebration Sunday represents, we've always lifted up our children as a powerful reminder, a reminder to give generously to keep this institution strong. We must remain relevant for the next generation. So someday they can assume the progressive mission of this church. Now, occasionally we have celebrated in different venues over the years, from the Rose Wagner Theater to the Marriott Dance Theater to Libby Gardner Hall, just to name a few. We've had a host of, of honored guests address us in meaningful ways, including three UUA presidents, two presidents of our UU seminaries, president of Americans United for the separation of church and state, and the president of our UU service committee. The most memorable, I think, was when the UUA president, Bill Sinkford, stood next to me at the Rose Wagoner on our, uh, on our celebration Sunday. It was there as our Sunday school kids marched onto that Rose Wagoner stage singing, I am a Unitarian. Sinkford watched in utter amazement and his jaw dropped when the, kid, when the kids sang, I got my badge right here. And as, they, as the kids marched off the stage to thunderous applause and whistles and screams of delight from the congregation, Sinkford leaned over to me and said, this is a most unusual congregation. And, and I said, oh, thank you. Thank you for noticing. Thanks for, for making that distinction. We are an unusual congregation. And if you wonder why that is, just look carefully at all the faces on your screen framed in those little Zoom boxes, and you will see unusual people who offer gifts of love packaged in myriad ways. Well, I'd like to light the chalice now in tribute to this most unusual congregation. And although the kids are not singing, I am a Unitarian, 
if we listen carefully, we can hear their youthful voices sing, sing to us tonight, or this morning, as we light the chalice, which is not easy to do from home. Symbol of light and knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. is Amanda Esco. And in case you don't know, I am lucky enough to be our director of religious education here at the First Unitarian Church. This morning, I am also lucky enough to be joined by some friends that will be on the screen very shortly. Um, I will be joined by Shiona Chambliss and Phoenix Richardson Sparrow and Iris Lander. Thank you, friends, for being with me this morning. This past couple weeks in religious education, we have been talking about the idea of beloved community and our community specifically. We've been discussing about what it does to make up a community. Considering our theme for this worship service, building our future together, we began to think about the church of the future and what we would want to build in that church. And if we can imagine one more 
fantastic room at First Unitarian Church. What would be in that room? My friends are here today to help show us what they would put in that one more room or space with their Legos. Shiona, what did you put in your fantastic room? And tell me the why behind it. What did you put, Shiona? Show me your spaces. Okay, so this is the bathroom. I love a gender inclusive bathroom. This is the study place. And another study place. A study place. And this is the playing area where you can play with this thing. The carpet. The carpet. Uh huh. And this is a meditation carpet where you can meditate. Awesome. I love spaces where we can be calm and be together in peace. What's in the middle? Is a trampoline. A trampoline. Love it. Thank love you, it. Shiona, for showing us your space. This is another desk. Love it, Shiona. Okay. Iris, Iris, what did you put in your spaces? Um, this is a campfire. And Where is your space? Is it inside or outside? Outside. Oh, I love using our outside spaces for our community. This is a campfire. Oh, this is a, and why we have a campfire is because it's fun. And this is a sandbox. And this is a little garden to grow food for people who need it. I love the addition of growing food for social justice projects for people that need it. Tables and to ensure that we are prepared. Should the need and more tables and chairs for our community so we can gather together. Two trees. I love it. And you put our two trees. Thank you, Iris. Phoenix, what did you put in yours? Ooh, oh, you're uh, like you can move around our spaces. Oh, um, I built an ice cream truck so um, everybody can eat ice cream, cream and um, make new friends. I love it. And I think we would all be in support of an ice cream chuck that just hangs out on campus. So in each of our spaces, we've talked about our big why behind it. And I've talked, I've heard you talk about places for community, for play, for sharing with each other, for being in silence together. And it's been hard this year, huh? Being away from our church building, right? We've missed our church building. We've missed our playground. We've missed being in our classrooms. But I have a question. This year on Zoom, have we still been able to be in community together? Yeah. Have we still played together? Yeah. Have we still found moments of stillness and calm? Yeah. Have we still been able to do our social justice projects like our backpack drive and our food drive this Christmas? Absolutely. So thinking about that then, while we still miss our building dearly and we miss being together, is it the building that makes up the church or the people? What is it, you guys? The people. It's the people. the people. It's the people that make up our church. That's right. Our church is our community. And that's how we're going to build our church in the future. Thanks, friends, for joining me today to talk about the spaces that you want to build. I really appreciate your vision for the future. And so on our friend, Mr. David Owens Lupu, actually wrote a song just about this and about this very idea about the people in our church. And it's one of our junior choir classics. So you'll see on the screen as we share it that the words are there. So please sing along at home while you stay muted to this favorite song of our community. Thanks friends.
Thank you, David. Thank you, friends, for showing us your church additions. We'll put it in the plans. Look for it in the future. So I, want, I got an email this week from a member of our congregation who's doing a fact check. He wanted to know whether our chapel had been constructed in 1921 or 1927. Well, I just couldn't remember right off the top of my head. I would have consulted that old white church history book if I'd had it handy, but it was in my office and I was at home. The congregant mentioned in his email that if our chapel had been built in 1921, then we'd better get busy planning a centennial celebration. <laughs> well, it turns out that the chapel was built and dedicated in 1927, not 1921. So we still have a few years to get ready for that big celebration. Nevertheless, I found it a helpful focal point for thinking about Celebration Sunday. It's almost impossible for us to imagine where our congregation will go in a hundred years. But it's not so hard to think about where we'll be in six years. Think about the new friends you will have made, the kids who are in religious education now who will have moved off to college or work in other places. Think about the five new babies who will play the role of baby Jesus in the Christmas pageants between now and then, and the memorial services at which we will gather to say goodbye. It's also useful on days like Celebration Sunday to consider how far we've come, isn't it? A few weeks ago, we celebrated the 130th anniversary of our congregation, our congregation's birthday. In 1891, our beautiful Georgian Revival Chapel on 13th East was still a dream that would be another 36 years in the making. How this congregation must have saved and scrimped to make that happen. People whose names we've long forgotten made room in their family budgets to squeeze a few extra bucks to put in the collection plate to make sure that generations of people they'd never meet but a place to call home. That's humbling to me, and I try not to forget it when I am in that chapel. Things certainly were different a hundred years ago. Could those folks possibly have dreamed up all the wonderful stuff we'd be doing now? Could they have imagined worship on something called Zoom or YouTube? <laughs> Could they have imagined what it would mean to be a sanctuary congregation? Those things were beyond our imaginations not that long ago. Yet here we are making it happen together. We are still building the future for which those people 100 years ago laid the foundation. These days, our church depends on a staff of trained professionals to manage all of our wonderful programs. A hundred years ago, the church might have depended on the Unitarian Women's Society to lick and stamp all the envelopes, print and fold an order of service. We didn't have an endowment, credit card processing, electronic employment verification, or any of the other complex financial instruments that keep our church going. Our building was less than half its current size without so much as cushions on the pews, never mind air conditioning or solar panels. A hundred years ago, I imagine we would have been glad to gather a dozen children together in a single room to do a simple craft and sing a few songs while the adults were in worship. A volunteer organist might have accompanied a few timeless hymns during our worship services and might have even played a few well-loved show tunes during a church event. And the congregation might have been content with a minister who preached a Sunday sermon, visited the sick and elderly a few times a week, and taught a weekly Bible study. Now, the two ministers work together to teach a whole range you don't have any of adult really? education and new member orientation classes lead many committee meetings, 
raise funds for an increasingly complex financial model, conduct pastoral care sessions for a congregation of as many as 600 people of all ages, as well as engaging in and overseeing social justice programs that include sanctuary, LGBTQ plus advocacy, racial justice initiatives, environmental justice, and interfaith cooperation. And of course, Sunday still comes around every week and that sermon's still gotta get written somehow. We host as many as 120 children in our religious education complex on Sundays and special occasions under the supervision of two talented professional educators and a small army of volunteers. We have a fantastic choir directed by a fantastic director and guest musicians enrich our services even more. Our building is lovingly maintained by a professional sexton and we have two courteous and detail-oriented administrators who manage the business of our church. Each one of us on staff at First Unitarian Church loves our job. I mean, we really love what we do. This work is rewarding and it makes a difference in people's lives. And I hope you can feel the love. On this Celebration Sunday, our church has a lot to be proud of. We are building for our future on a firm foundation. We fully fund our programming every year so that these professionals have the money to do their jobs effectively. We've taken good care of our facilities by being prudent over time and through a successful capital cam campaign. And we've built up a healthy endowment to ensure our financial stability in the long run. Three legs of the stool are secure. Well, we have one wobbly leg. The funding with which we take care of our staff, our wonderful professional staff who have taken such good care of us this year and every year. As we've put resources into programming, facilities, and investments, funding for our staff has unfortunately fallen a little behind. And our church community is growing. Even during this pandemic, we are welcoming visitors and signing on new members in order to continue to grow and provide good ministry to this growing community. We need to pay our professional staff adequately to the jobs they're doing. We need to keep pace with increasing wage standards. We need to make sure that each of them has the benefits they need, including professional development funding. To do this, we are increasing our pledge goal 20% from its pre-pandemic level. Let's hold on to that number and breathe into it for a moment. Our pledge goal this year is $610,000, an increase of 20% from our pre-pandemic level. Now, how are we going to get there? Well, first of all, we know that this is a tall order. So we're going to give ourselves two years to achieve our eventual goal. Second, we're going to show you some highlights of the proposed budget for next year in our coffee hour discussion today. So you can really see for yourselves where the challenges are. But most importantly, we have some courageous discussions about what it is going to cost to maintain the high level of ministry to which we've all become accustomed. We're going to move toward the interim period of the next two years by beginning the discussion right now about what sort of a future we imagine for ourselves. We won't have the option of being content with what we have now. We have a choice to make that will inform all the other choices that follow in the next two years and will provide the foundation of the future that we want to build together. And I'm a big believer in shared goals that are easy to describe. So here are a few goals to reach for during this pledge season. For a start, we'd like to see 20 new pledges. Maybe that's from our new members and thank you in advance for that. Or Maybe it's from people who've been a part of our church community for a long time, but have never pledged. We're asking you to become part of our story 
by investing in this community this year. Here's a second goal. We'd like to see 50 families increase their pledge by 20% or more. We can do this. These are doable goals. All of these are doable goals. Listen, we are living in a really special moment right now. This moment when we have a year's worth of kinetic energy built up behind us and we're ready to burst forth with a new vision, new energy, new excitement. People in our community are so ready to gather with other people again. They're ready to see what church is all about. They're ready for the promise of liberal religion in these times of isolation and uncertainty. Honestly, who isn't ready for those things? We all are. It's time. We're not going back. We are going forward, building a future that is bolder and brighter than we can imagine. We have a big challenge ahead. But we're ready to meet it. I invite you to be a part of it. Thank you. David, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you before, but you got a great left hand when it comes to the keyboard. Just, uh, just fabulous. Thanks, thanks so much. You know, it's always, um, it's always very exciting to contemplate the future, and it's only natural that at this time of transition in the church's ministerial leadership that we are especially motivated to consider where this church is going next. Now the extra focus and attention in shaping the future is not necessarily a judgment on your retiring minister, although one can't always be that sure. It's simply that the prospect of new perspectives, new ideas, new passions, new rhythms, new styles, can't help but quicken the pulse and direct our gaze towards new possibilities for this extraordinary church community. This congregation is ready to embark on a new journey. It's time to assess its current programs for enriching the lives of its members and friends, and then contemplating bolder and more exciting opportunities for growth and personal development. And given this church's record of direct involvement in social justice issues, it must now look to new areas of engagement as the earth continues to grow more fragile and vulnerable, and the disparities between rich and poor become alarmingly wider. Like every journey oriented toward the future, with expectations of a promised land awaiting them, there's an unavoidable recurrent theme. It's a variation on the Jewish metaphor that everywhere we are is Egypt, and the only way to get to the promised land is through the wilderness. The wilderness will test your metal. 
excitement about the future must not be tempered because wilderness stands before each and every journey. And even the Bible speaks the truth on this one. But we're not, we're not talking immediate gratification. We're talking instead about a process, the journey itself, the exercise of a church community lifting its 130-year-old institution to meet the modern world fraught with imposing challenges to its progressive ideals. In acknowledging that there's wilderness between here and there, between Salt Lake City and the Promised Land, a new resolve must wind its way into our hearts and instruct us to plan carefully and selflessly in building our future. The Promised Land is never reached without deep commitments and by making some personal sacrifices. We need to get our heads around this journey that will take us from here to where we want to be and where we deserve to be. That journey begins today. Today, we look ahead to the needs of the world that is well, fast approaching the middle of the 21st century. What's the new vision that will help shape our beloved community in a new era with new technologies, new issues, new ways of working, playing, new ways of just being together? How will we be able to respond to the prophetic call in a time when hostilities towards those who are voiceless and powerless are even further deepened than they are today. How will we preserve our democracy against greater threats than we have ever known? What's the, what's the image that will help us restore a, a balance between the human and natural world? providing a, a holistic concept that embraces them both. What will the moral community look like in the next decade or two? But without a vision, we will have very little to offer. The demands for personal involvement and commitment and energy to this church community will only grow more intensely as we make our way through the wilderness. Building our future must remain our focal point. The journey needs to inspire us to action. You know, there's, no, there's no time and we don't have the luxury to pull back and, and just be an idle spectator. We all need to be doers and movers and shakers. You know, in fact, there's a, there's a wonderful old quip that states that the trouble with radicals is all they ever do is just sit around and read radical literature. And yet, this is slightly better than reactionaries who don't read anything at all. But still, the message is clear. Pursuing the promised land must be more than an intellectual exercise. The journey calls for all of us to become more fully engaged physically and spiritually and commitment-wise. The new leadership that you will ultimately call to this church needs your full support and enthusiasm and love and commitment because the journey won't be easy. Every step along the way will require us to reflect on, reflect on what we value because it is precisely our values that are being challenged by forces that, that simply cannot fathom a beloved community. 
The insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th was a, a shock to our system, but it was a, a sobering portent of what we face in the years ahead. The journey will require of us to re-examine our institutional power. And yes, I mean power, the power wrought by our wealth, prestige, visibility, and vision, by our congregational commitment and its ministries. We cannot avoid the exercise of power, of neutrality, in the face of injustice runs, runs well, pretty close to the equivalent of endorsement. The trek towards our future will make obvious that our decisions requiring institutional resources and power are ultimately political decisions, much like our vote following the service to sign on as plaintiffs in the lawsuit against ICE. The future will preclude the possibility of remaining passive because our values, our values must be brought to the public square as a moral voice championing the beloved community. We begin to build our future today with a pledge of financial support. Now, this is certainly not our first celebration Sunday together, asking for your generosity, but I deeply believe it's the most critical pledge kickoff our congregation has ever had to face. Your pledge will shape, shape the direction of this church's journey towards the future. Your pledge will determine the strength and power of this community, what we can possibly wield in this valley, our nation, even the world. Your pledge will support new ministries, new technologies, new programs that will educate our children, develop our spiritual growth, and bless us with the riches of music and the arts. We belong to this church community because it represents to us what religion is supposed to mean. This church exemplifies the very concept of religion that we always have carried in our hearts. This institution is about the freedom of ideas, the, the awesome joy of gathering in worship with those who share your progressive values shaped by deep ecology, feminist consciousness, and the relentless commitment to a just and peaceful world. Your pledge will enable this church to fulfill the vision we all share, offering a healing alternative to tribalism, ending exploitation of the powerless, restoring the, restoring the natural world, and answering the prophetic call to eliminate those egregious disparities between rich and poor. The journey requires more of us than just making an easy pledge or a minimal pledge, which may have guided some of us in the past. Today marks a wake up call that the future of this church depends on extraordinary generosity to the point where you might even surprise yourselves by how much you actually want to give. And so, yeah, the journey, the journey has begun. We must build our future together. We are resting on 130 years of proven history. Now it's our turn. 
to move this institution, to move ourselves, to get ready for the next generation, we must move forward. Amen. Do, do. I will do